City Life came out the next uh, in '75. Um, uh, after we started doing that, we started to have gold records. In other words, uh, you can see on my wall here, gold records with City Life. The next three records that we did: City Life, Unfinished Business, Action. They were million sellers. Um, so we begin a new phase with City Life in that Barney Perry leaves the group. Uh, Alan Barnes leaves the group, and there's three of us left, essentially. Keith, Kilgore, Joe Hall, and myself. But we're the rhythm section, so we can carry on. You have bass, drums, and piano, keyboards, and we do carry on. Um, we come to City Life marks the first time in the studio that the Mizell brothers had backed off, and Donald was going to produce him more. He was more in the producer's shoes. You know, he had got his chops kind of together on the first two records. We had the Mizell brothers with us, even though the Mizell brothers would come in and do a few things on City Life. They didn't do as much. So City Life marked the time where now um, some of our songs came from band grooves, like Rock Creek Park. The story behind Rock Creek Park is that we were um, in, in Camden, New Jersey, getting ready to do a show uh, with the Commodores, and at sound check, we start this groove, and this groove hits, and we tape it. We're having fun. We're just grooving, right? And it's, it's, it's everything that it is on the record, and we played it for Donald. I don't even know if Donald was at the sound check, but we, we played it back to him, and he said, yeah, let's cut this. So that went on there. We also um, put together the groove of Happy Music, at some sound check or on some gig in, in Boston. We would go to Boston and play uh, Paul's Mall, uh, the jazz workshop often, and we'd be there. You know, during those days, you could not only did we play the concerts with all those people who I just told you about and more, the Commodores, all the top R&B, all the top jazz groups, but we'd then go to the jazz clubs and, and hang out for there and play for six, seven days where we really had a chance to practice and get our musicianship together and collectively develop this sound. Um, so I want to say with City Life, not only is Donald um, uh, uh, producing more, we, we are taking more control of our sound. I think City Life really represents the new Blackbirds or the mature, the arrived Blackbirds. We had arrived not only commercially what was going to happen, which we had no idea was going to happen, but we had arrived with our sound. Everything had gelled together. All these years of practicing and playing together, we kind of lived, ate, slept music, um, dated chicks together. We did everything together, really. Um, um, and so, um, you know, Keith, I know Keith Kilgo out of the group. Uh, we had a bond with everybody. Keith and I had a really, really had a strong bond, and, um, you know, it really put put our music together, and we had this strong chemistry that went from out of the studio to in the studio as well. Um, so that album, I just got to say, I mentioned at the outset, just an incredible record and kind of funny, you know, I had never been to uh, Washington, D.C. in my life until just a few years ago because I lived in Los Angeles and moved to North Carolina right. some years ago. But I, when I was there and for the first time actually saw Rock Creek Park, it was such a, a thrill because, you know, it's like, oh, that's Rock Creek Park. So, you know, what, what inspired, you know, what was going on in Rock Creek Park that inspired that song? Well, first of all, we had the song and the track before we had the title. And that, ha that often happened with us because we wrote from the music perspective. We weren't necessarily lyricists thinking about how to write a lyrical song, et cetera, et cetera. We put the lyrics together after we had a groove. Um, and so uh, I remember we in the studio and we were trying to think about what to call it. And we just, this chant just came up. And then doing it in the park, doing it after dark, oh yeah, in Rock Creek Park. And that was it, because every you know we knew what everybody did in Rock Creek Park. Rock Creek Park is this big park in D.C. that takes up the whole length of the city. And it's got huge boulders and rock. And it was just catchy and infectious, you know. And, um, you know, it didn't take a brain surgeon to figure that out. Doing it in the park, doing it after dark, oh yeah, Rock Creek Park. And not only did that song hit and became a hit song for us, it was such a catchy song that people could adapt that song when we went to anywhere else. If we went to Philadelphia, we sang whatever the park was there. In Boston, we sang whatever the park. Wherever we were, it was your park. And so, you know, we were blessed. That record really skyrocketed us to, it skyrocketed us to, it really gave us acceptance, which what we wanted, into the funk world. 
into the R&B funk world while still being jazzy. And see, we didn't appreciate the jazziness of it. It would take us years to, uh, to deal with it later. We did it, but we were still trying to be like everybody else, not realizing that God had already given us a gift to be different. Our gift was is that we could play R&B, and we understood that because we grew up with it. But the difference between us and most of the groups, at least a lot of the groups that were out there, is that they didn't put it on record. They thought they compartmentalized it. Donald had the vision to know that, you know what, these worlds are all really part of what the African-American experience is. They should coexist. There is no shame in, in mixing jazz with your R&B or mixing gospel with this, that, or the other. It's, it's what you know. The only thing that limits you is what you think. So we had that distinction. And so anyway, let's go talk about city life. City life opens up the doors for whatever. Walking in rhythm has set us up. That has set us up with the pop world. Now, now we come up with um, city life, and we've got three songs, happy music, right? We've got um, um, uh, we, we, we've got uh, Rock Creek Park. We've got two, and those two songs are still two of our top songs besides walking in rhythm. Uh, rock. Then you got to put Rock Creek Park, Happy Music, and we the can title go track on. too. The title track, City Life. I must say, I've had the distinction and the blessing too, um, um, to Scott to say that at least three of my three of the albums were named after my songs. Okay, I mean, I don't know how that happens, but City Life is my song. I wrote that song, and that became the title track. Don't know how it happened. Unfinished Business. Go to that next album. That's my song. Grammy nominated. And so it was a blessing to that, you know. Um, but anyway, City Life, we had these hit songs and, um, and, 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 and the sound had come together and, and the R&B world was ready for us. We began the headline shows then. Um, uh, we began to um, be costumed. Uh, we began to have international success over in England um, and, 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 and parts of Europe. And, you know, it it, it 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 went on and on. So we had that. We had a new um, uh, guitar player, Ovo Saunders, had a different flavor than Barney. He brought something else extra to it, you know, and something in additional. So look, you know, we were down this path. Um, that record was so successful for us. Um, probably our biggest selling record. Um, that our next record was a challenge to make almost. Um, and I remember us coming back into the studio. We had we wrote thirty songs. And I remember the first batch we came up with. Yes, unfinished business. I remember Donald. Yeah, that's city life, right? I remember Donald didn't like any of the songs on the, the first batch we came up with. And um, he, 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 Donald had a working with Donald Berg was you had to be a strong guy. Donald had a, a hard way of really telling you you screwed up or, or get it together. And he wasn't nice about it. He was cool, but he was still old school. Basically, he beat you up. And so if you didn't have a, a, a thick skin, you could be crushed. And that's what happened to some of the earlier group members. They were crushed. Um, and they person they, their personalities just didn't work out. Anyway, we, we move forward. But Donald didn't like those first batches, so he sent us back to the drawing board. Now, I was always the kind of person, if you tell me no once, I, I'm going to get a yes. I, okay, I'll go back. I'll show you. I'll go back and write up a whole nother story. So we ended up writing and recording about 30 songs uh, to come up with Unfinished Business. Um, I don't think we tried to reduplicate that, but for some reason or another, we had some other issues going on at that time. And um, the record came out. It did what it did. Um, I personally believe that it wasn't one of our better records. Um, and that's just not to necessarily compare it to, to, to what we had before. It's just that I don't think the gel of it um, came together as uh, musically. Um, and so, but we had success with it because we were on the roll and it was different enough that nobody could say, oh, they tried to, they tried to come up with another city life. And so blessings as it is, we, we, we cut it. And we continued our climb to success. Um, and then also before we did um, City Life, we also did the soundtrack to Cornbread, Earl and Me, which also got us up a notch because now we're into the movie theaters as the soundtrack 
on our second album. Um, uh, after our second album, and that was a nice boost to be up and you know and you know Donald essentially composed the soundtrack and got an arrangement to work with it. We had some songs. We did play on all the songs though, and um, and we had success with that. So now comes um, our next album would be. Um, oh, and by the way, as I mentioned with City Life, by the time City Life comes up, we had kind of realized a point now that we can compete with the funksters out there. Um, oh, oh, we were funky, and we wanted to be funky. Walking in Rhythm and Flying Stout were nice, but they weren't really the funk, and that was okay. They were funky in its own sense, and again, we didn't recognize what we had. But coming with City Life, that we, we really be, this is a funkier Blackbirds now. Still doing jazz and all that other stuff, but now you know, you know, our funk was funky, <laughs> so we'll yeah. just leave it at that right there. Uh, the yeah. next record, Flying Star, uh, the next record, Unfinished Business, we put that out there. Uh, we don't get the hits off that one, uh, that we got vocally on the first or, or on City Life, but what we did get was something even more amazing we got a Grammy nomination for the title cut for instrumental for best instrumental. Uh, track, which was my song, Unfinished Business. Um, and so that was that was success. That was the sweet smell of success. Um, as you can see, by that time, we were an award-winning group. Not only were we selling gold records, uh, as you can see on my wall, but we had the number one billboard uh, instrumental pop group, the number one um, um, uh, industry awards from the NAACP, um, um, and so on and so forth. We've got uh, just awards here. Number one billboard, number one cash box. I got cash box, record world. Th those, those don't even exist. We made front covers of those, right? That's a big deal. Um, college okay. students still, right? Can, can I throw something in, Kevin? Sure. Yeah, so at that time, you know, I was um, in junior high but or high school, either one. But there was a radio station in Los Angeles where I lived called KDAY, KDA 1580. Right, right. And that was the station. And I swear, it seemed like they played like every cut off of City Life. I mean, that's the kind of record it was where they went so deep into it and they played like everything. Back in those days, they were doing that, not so much nowadays. Oh, that was, that, that was a remarkable time where you can get that kind of coverage. I mean, you know, with these days, we're more into a singles market. Um, and you know, they'll, they'll just do cut after cut, you know, you can keep putting the singles out there, but <clears throat> that was amazing, really amazing. And, and, and I think having that coming from that era really helped to establish us. See, we established ourselves not only as pop R and B musicians, but as really real musicians that could play. Um, and that was again, uh, part of our appeal. So look, you know, we fast forward from after um, uh, unfinished business. We're still having success, um, and we're still, you know, we we had hit records. So at this point, you know, those hit records, uh, hit songs were still great for us. They still show our closers. Now we come to the last album that we're going to make with Donald Bird. Not knowing that, but we made the Action album. Um, An Action, um, we we had a couple of hits off of there, Soft and Easy, um, Supernatural uh, Feeling. Supernatural feeling. Soft, you know, action to me would have been my second best Blackbird record. I think we had gotten back to who the Blackbirds were. We had had some conversations with Donald. Um, I remember we. this was a point also where we had started to grow up and we were challenging Donald on several levels um, um, with the production, uh, with our royalties, with our monies. You know, we had successful records but we weren't really seeing the fruits of that. We weren't seeing an increase in pay from our, from our, from our live show, from when we had City Life out to action. We were making pretty much the same money. Um, so that was a whole different, that was a whole dynamic that was reflective. On the record end, I recall uh, we went out there and had these tracks. We felt good about them. We had gotten really back into sync and with each other in the groove um, on, um, Action, you'll see us on Unfinished Business, particularly Action, now you see us incorporating some other musicians, such as uh, on Action, uh, we bring Ray Parker in to, to double up on some of the guitar stuff to give us another flavor. Flavor. We bring in Ollie Brown, a studio drummer um, and a friend from Detroit to, to do some drums. On bass, we bring in uh, a David Shields from 
one of my high school buddies to bring up another element that we wanted to have that was not um, emanating from the members, right? Um, but that was okay. That was the way to be flexible. Um, on let, me, let me ask, when you brought those guys in, Kevin, did it make it more challenging to replicate some of that live when they weren't there? No, it didn't because that meant whoever were doing it had to practice it if they want to stay in the group. <laughs> they had to really make the changes, and, and they had to grow. It's about really growing. It's about growing and trying to give the music what it needed to be. And um, so most of us were on the page with that. Um, you know, I remember having challenges with Donald about the arrangements. By the time we got to, one of the problems we had with Unfinished Business that we didn't have with City Life was that we felt, the group felt that it was too over-orchestrated. Even though it had the jazzy stuff, it was great, it was, it, it was too much. It was too much, and it, it, it covered up a lot of the band's funk. And we experienced that on action, too. And I remember coming to Donald saying, you know, Donald, out of due respect to you, um, you know, we feel that, because I was the leader of the group during that time from from 74 on, Donald made me the leader. Not only was I his, his right-hand man doing college and all that stuff, and I did all his transcriptions, I did his music stuff, uh, but he made me the leader of the group. Um, and so with that, you know, I, you know, he would give me a lot more responsibility of organizing the guys, this, that, and the other. And everything was cool. You know, we, we, we were cool with it. So I tried to represent the group in the best way I could, too, even musically. And so I would stand up for things that we needed to have stand up, like Donald. You know, we're cool here, man, but we need to make more money here. What's going, you know, what? Can, let's address that. We said, well, oh, you have your time. Your time ain't here yet. And so we're thinking, well, heck, we got gold records and hit records, and we're playing top shows. If it ain't now, when is it? So we can never address that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that that um, led to the demise of the group. But I also remember coming to him on the Action album and saying, Donald, uh, we don't like the arrangements. This just is too busy. And then I remember him snapping back and saying, okay, Kevin, you don't like it. You write it yourself. And, of course, I took to it, you know. And and I came back in another day or two, and here's the arrangements, Donald. Okay, let's play them and record them. And he let me do it. But I was that kind of guy, instead of backing up and getting crushed, uh, I, I like to take the challenge. There were a few of us in the group who were cool with taking the challenge uh, of tough love, so to speak. And it was tough love. He wanted us to be the best, and I, I get it. Look, Donald Bird had played with – the top musicians. I mean, we 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 have the We have the legacy that other groups don't have, and that he played with a John Coltrane, or he played with um, the top musicians, uh, Sonny Rollins, uh, all that great legacy, you know, coming forth. And he's just trying to pour that into us. So that 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 was cool. Anyway, um, to try to get to the meat of the story, so we were changing our sound, um, and so yep, when we were having some conflicts with Donald about the business and the production. And so we cut the record, though. The record came out, and uh, I remember when the record came out, late 77, if I believe, and we had some success with it, but not the kind of success that they had hoped on, but it still went gold. So we were still in the game. But then after that came out, um, some things would change then. You know, Do by then, Donald had left Howard, and he was teaching down at NCCU. So, um, you know, during the heyday of... Uh, of of our hits, by the time Unfinished Business hit, most of us were not in school. We took a sabbatical. We were having too much success. And tell you the truth, I don't think any of us ever told Donald either. We just kept it, you know, we just kept going on with it. And some of us didn't finish and others did. Now, here's my story. The academic side of it, come 1978, when we, we had the action album out there, um, uh, and I'm back in school now, because I'm gonna graduate. It just took me seven years to graduate, right? Sounds but like I made it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I just had to, you know, there was sometimes I wasn't in schools or I, I had to drop out because I was so far behind. But who cares? It's all how you end up, right? So I got my BA in 78 within jazz studies. I was one of the first jazz studies majors to graduate, and I also was a music composition. Keith Kilgo, um, drummer of the group, who's the current leader of the group, would go back and get his um, uh, degree as well. Now he's a doctor of music, right? But um, come 78 was the, the change of wind, the winds, the winds of change had come upon us. 
Be uh, before, Kevin, before you jump into that and we move away from it, I just have to pay respect to Supernatural Feeling. That was one of my favorites, and that track sure. oh, just blew, blew up. I mean, the bass and the and the synthesizer fills you had on it, right. tremendous. Well, you know what made that so funky is that we got another bass player too. We got that's the, that's the track that David Shields was on, and he's playing all that funky thump uh, Graham Central stuff that we weren't getting on our own records. Um, that's one of the changes we made. But that was that is a funky cut, you know. And um, we had Ernie Watts playing on there. Uh, <laughs> by that record, we weren't singing as much on the records. We weren't. We we had studio musicians. Things were starting to kind of. Do, decay with Donald and the group, you know, the relationship, it was switching, you know, Donald had, it's kind of like he had his stuff, but we didn't have our stuff. And, and in truth, Donald wasn't really connecting with us. Um, you know, he was kind of like, you know, he had his planes, he had his art collection, and he had the success, but that wasn't being funneled down to us. And so we'll talk about how that led to us going to court. Who, 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 is, who is the female on Soft and Easy? The Soft and Easy female was, um, 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 she was the uh, secretary at the recording studio, the Sound Factory. And the guy doing all the talking was a guy named Ollie Brown, a drummer, and he was oh, yeah. a friend of mine and um, uh, went on to produce a lot of records. So all that stuff was put on and soft and easy. And look, we, you know, we had a hit record off there. Again, I think that was one of our best records playing wise, you know, uh, looking ahead, uh, dreaming of you. I mean, we had, to me, we had come back with the Blackbird sounds of the, of the late 70s. We were right in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the winds of change came and, 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 and we confronted, Don, we, we, we would confront Don, Donald Byrd with, with our issues that we had. We had grown up. We're 23, 24 by then, had success, and we wanted some change. Um, and Donald wasn't having that. We, 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 I remember going out to California. Uh, I remember we drove across California. In fact, this should be in a book, right? But I remember us getting in a car, getting in a, getting in a, um, in our cars, the four of us, Orville, Joe, myself, and Keith, we drove across the country literally with no money at this time because we hadn't gotten any royalties. And we walked out and we and we came to where Donald was staying and we wanted to confront him in person because we wanted to do an audit because we just couldn't believe the numbers. We said, look, well, if we got gold records and, you know, when we have this, that, and the other, where's the money? You know, it's a typical story. And so he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't answer the, um, the um, accountants. So we said, we're going to go out there. So we did a surprise visit, right? We did a surprise visit, and, and at 7 o'clock in the morning, we arrived at Donald Burr's apartment where he lives, or house. And, and I remember this like it was yesterday. And, and we turn on the, um, uh, the intercom, and, and, and we're not going to say, hey, it's Kevin, keep Joe and Orville. Donald, hey, how are you? It's Kevin, keep Joe and Orville. And nothing. We know they were there. And uh, we knew he was there with the person he stayed with. Nothing, nothing. So we said, God, we, we're mad as hell. So we said, you know what, at that time we had, this is a tell-all, but it's all good, right? You know, it's all good. We had apartments out here, too, that we leased to Donald Byrd that were supposed to be ours, that we paid money for, that he, that we paid money from out of our contract. So we said, you know what, well, we're going to just go to our apartments. We go to our apartments and somebody else is living in there. You know, we're out of our minds now, coming all the way across the country, thinking that if we see Donald, first of all, Donald's going to talk to us. And, and cut us a check, right? Um, and, and so none of that happens. So, you know, we had enough to last for a few days. So we call a record company, right? And we tell them the record company what's going on. They didn't like this. You know, we were their top group. By the way, they top group and, how, and they're in squabbles with, with the producer. So they set us up. They sent us the money. You know, they sent us money. We're cool for a minute. But anyway, we stay in California for about a month hoping to reach Donald Byrd. So Donald totally squashes us. We don't hear from him. I think we hear from his lawyers. And so from that point on, in, in the fall of 78, now we're on this whole tangent now to get a new deal and get out of the contract. It ends up with us um, coming to the top of 79. And I'll never forget this. Um, we end up going to court. 
because we could not talk to Donald Byrd. He refused to talk to us. Um, did you feel yeah, betrayed? So, pardon me? Did you feel betrayed, Kevin? I did. I, and maybe other, the other guys had to, too, but I think me particularly because I thought I had this relationship with him um, and that we had talked so much outside of the group, not that we were trying to be secret or he was favoring me. We just had a relationship. You know how it is. You just have it. I remember there were several times that I tried to reach out outside of the group to Donald. You know, before we were going to court, I knew we were going to court. We had our management. We were all talking. We knew it was happening. But I said to myself, it couldn't be coming to this. I remember reaching out to him, calling him, nothing, leaving him a message saying, hey, Donald, you know, what's going on? Hey, let's, let's talk. I'm sure we, I said, I'm sure we didn't come this far for that. I was more emotional than I am now, but absolutely. So I remember going to court. And in the court, the name of the court case was Kevin Tony et al. They, they, my, my name was in the court case. Kevin Tony et al. versus Donald Byrd. We went there to sue for three things. One, to get the name. Two, to get out of the production contract. And three, to get out of our publishing contract and get our songs. So here's what the case was. And here's to show you how, 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 how legal stuff works. And everybody listening out there, learn this lesson. Um, we, 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 we were able to get out of production contra uh, contracts. We got out of that. Um, he, we had to stay in the publishing agreement for the length of it because when you sign publishing, you sign publishing. By the way, don't ever sign your publishing. Public is, publishing is sacred, but he owned the publishing. On all those hit songs that we recorded, that's in the Donald Burger State. Uh, in terms of the use of the name, we also sued to get the name, claiming that we were the Blackbirds. We had created the name. We're the ones associated with it. Well, guess how that turned out? It turned out that um, two months before we went to court, Donald Byrd, we found out that he had um, copyright, uh, got a trademark on the name. So guess what? All this time, if any of us had any wits or any, any business sense back then, we could have owned the name. But none of us, not even Donald had the name Blackbird trademark till two months before court. And so anyway, we what we end up ended up happening was that um, uh, we got use of the name, right? You had use of the name, uh, but you had to pay a percentage of it. So you know already that was kind of a, a negative twist on it. And so you know we come out of the court thing, still never saw, saw Donald. That was it, really. That was that was it. Donald was in his thing, and you know the winds are changing. It's time to move on. It's time to move on. So then we go to set up to record our next record. But however, when we come to this point, I kind of knew at that point, I had graduated from a college, uh, Howard, and, and I, I, I had more on my mind than just being on the Blackbirds. I wanted to make the records and make the transition, but I also wanted to set myself up so that I can uh, begin a solo career. So I had, we had our new deal going in with Fantasy is that we would record our record, um, and, and I could do two records with them, firm or, or, or leave if something happened. And so I cut the first record with them, get ready to cut the second record with them. I have some differences with the Blackbirds that were irrecyclable, and I leave the group. Um, I just left, I left the group, and I cut, up, I cut my first solo record, Special K. That, that last album was called Better Days. Yes, by the way, the last Blackbird record was called Better Days. Now, that was uh, kind of ironic titling, was it not? It was, considering that, well, yeah, it was better days in that we were out of the Donald Byrd thing, and now we were into a new thing. But in a sense, it was ironic because some of the issues that, well, how does this, how can you say it? You never know the people you deal with, too. You have to deal with them in uh, real-life close situations. And so after leaving Donald Byrd, I think everybody got to really know who everybody was. If you follow what I'm saying, what you thought, how you really thought about business, this, that, and the other. And this is not to knock anybody. It's just to say that we had difference of opinion about how things were going to run in the music, this, that, and the other. And um, so it was supposed to be better days. But really, after that, um, uh, the group didn't do much. When I left the group, I, I did a record. I think they went in the studio, cut another record that was never released. And um, I, I got to ask you on, on better days. So uh, George Duke came in. 
and produced. Oh, yeah, so, let's talk about that. George Duke came yeah. in and produced it. I mean, that, that was a treat. I mean, for me, as a keyboard player, George was one of my, <clears throat> one of my heroes. That's what and I figured. For me to be next to him, and of course, he respected us, too. But I respected George as one of the keyboard uh, icons and, 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 and icons of a modern, uh, a modern keyboard popular music. I mean, he's, he's in the top five on my list of all times, and may he rest in peace still. But, um, you know, really my head wasn't there. I remember doing it. You know, I cut the record. We had another keyboard player on there. So, look, we had some records that, that you know, and essentially why I made that record, I was really in transition. I was out in the road, and I was really making records with Bill Summers and Summers Heat hmm. and got a hit off of that record. I wrote his hit song called Call It What You Want, which was a top 10 R&B song hmm. and got on the pop chart. So I was touring with Bill and just kind of like, you know, it was we just come to, you know, it was a transition time. I made the record. Then I came doing this, and then I want to do this, that, and the other. So, um, was 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 that transition purely business based, or was there any of it based on how music and things were changing too? Because at that time, it was like the end of disco and going to the, you know, kind of synthetic pop of the '80s. Did that play a role at all too, or was it just all the business? No, I, well, it was business, and I think just musical direction. I, I think at that time, none of us. I remember. I kind of didn't want to have the reins of it, you know, after that point. And I kind of gave, and I gave, I kind of, I gave the reins really to Keith, and I just showed up. I just, I just showed up to make the records and to collect the paychecks. But my heart and leadership, all that wasn't really there. I was, I wanted to do some different things. Look, you know, being in a group for a number of years, when you commit to that, you know, um, there's a certain commitment of time and, and, and that you put to it. And you know, I knew that. I wanted to do other musical things. I just I wanted to do more than just play with the Blackbirds. And I knew for me that that was a great man. I could never buy that experience. Uh, Scott, if you ask me if I can go back in time and do it again at age 18, 19, what would I do? I would only pray and say, God, give me that again. Give me something like that. I couldn't buy that experience. I mean, and what I learned business wise, musically wise, a lot of what I do now is Found it is founded in that, and um, and a lot of what I don't do, of how I learned, you know, a lot of what I don't do. So the lessons I learned where I was burned or where there was bad business and things didn't work out the way they should, I promised myself I wouldn't do that and wouldn't treat, you know, people this, that, the other. It was a learning experience. Fortunately for us, okay. Uh, so so to answer that question, yes, uh, it was it was also musical things. Yes, disco and all that stuff was changing. But I, you know, and, and, and I think we saw that. But I still think, for the most part, we were still musician-based. So we were going to still cut records, still live, even if it was with a drum machine. We were musicians that were going to cut records where we played on them. So that didn't really play into that too much at that point, even though we knew the technology was coming along. Uh, it was just time for me. I had reached a. I was at the end of that season. And it was another season in front of me. I'd also just gotten married. And so my, my thoughts about doing things were a little different. Again, I wanted to play different types of music too. Be, I want to have different experience. I want to play with different people. Before we go on and talk about your, your solo uh, works, I, I just had to ask you, you know, at the height of the Blackbirds chemistry, you know, when you guys were really gelling together, could you just describe what that was like spiritually uh, spiritually as well as musically and just what that experience was like well the experience was just like we were brothers i mean we were just close brothers we did everything together we listened to the same music uh we hung out afterwards we go to the parties um um keith and i you know we had an affinity for playing straight ahead jazz so when we weren't doing that we did a lot of jazz with a lot of people in, in dc and we hung together we were just buddies so Without knowing that, that it was a spiritual connection, we were kid, kindred spirits. It wasn't like we were worshiping in church and really recognize God like I do now. Yeah. We knew that we had something special. And when we played music together, it was just a wonderful experience that it was. So it was a spiritual experience because we were playing the music beyond, um, beyond just playing the gig or playing the songs. and. And we had this sound that we worked on. We used to practice the same licks, the same improvisations. Um, 
you know, that's, that's an experience that um, for a, a group chemistry, we had a group chemistry that was at that time undeniable and unbreakable into the winds of change hit us. Um, and then when the winds of change hit us, uh, we went forward. Again, I think, again, the Blackbirds experience, I would not trade that in for the world. I build my foundation on that, that um, experience and, and what I, uh, the success I've had from that um, is still um, classic now. Like you say, um, how about walking in Rock Creek Park is a theme song for Washington, D.C. Um, how about those songs still play uh, on um, now to generations now that Rock Creek Park has been one of the most sampled songs? How mm -hmm. about now that into my career now as a solo artist? I've had a, um, God has blessed me with a long, enduring solo career that's been longer than the Blackbirds. I mean, I've had 20 plus years of making um, records as a solo artist. Um, and so, and as I'm making records as a solo artist, um, um, I get to you know build on the foundation from the Blackbirds. But let me say, I want you know, speaking of my solo career, um, I want to mention this. You mentioned something when you first opened up our conversation about smooth jazz. Well, let me say this. In true smooth jazz, that 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 the name smooth jazz was not even thought of in this in the, when, when we were making those records. Smooth jazz it was a, was a movement and wasn't coined until the late '80s. However. You're correct in saying that we were on the forefront of what is being known as that because we were mixing back then um, soft vocals with R&B. We did that way before they did it, except we played, except our, our definition of jazz came more from, a, from the tradition of jazz. What, what smooth jazz is for a lot of it, a lot of smooth jazz, not all of it, but here's where you can cut the chase or you can cut the difference between the men and the boys. Um, there's a certain percentage of jazz, smooth jazz, that is based solely on R&B and no jazz improvisation. They're just riffing, but they don't really play the history of jazz improvisation. To me, you cannot have jazz in this purest song, or even in this commercial sense, without talking and playing the language of jazz, chord changes, or being outside um, and, and, and having um, um, chords that are that are jazz favorite chords. Let me mention this, if I may. It's happened throughout history. Um, um, you know, you know, people may have called the Blackbirds a Donald Bird sellout, but that's a bunch of horse stuff from critics who don't have the story right. Because in truth, Duke Ellington did the same thing in the '30s when he had his music out. Except Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington played his jazz over a dance over a dance rhythm called swing. At that time, swing was a dance. Guess what Charlie Parker did in the 40s? He played his jazz over a rhythm called bebop, which was a dance. Hmm. We go into the 60s and the 50s, the same thing. You know, um, you, 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 60s is a little more different cool jazz, but by the time we get to the 60s with jazz and commercial music, because I want to bring a point out between commercial music and jazz. Um, you get boogaloo music, and, and you get music that um, people were having success like Lee Morgan with the Gigolo or Horse Silvers, and they were playing jazz over popular rhythms of the day. Come to the 70s, you get Donald Byrd, right, and Herbie Hancock, who are playing jazz records over, over the rhythms of the day that are funk, right? And then you come to the 70s, you also have jazz fusion, but the ones that were having success over, over the crossover market play jazz over, com over commercial um, rhythms. The same is true today with Robert Glasper or, or anyone that's doing that. And when smooth jazz came, smooth jazz is a watered down term for really instrumental R&B music in a sense. And um, so anyway, that's my, that's my take on that. I want to, I want to be on the record for that, but there I, are. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you spelled that out because I mean, I've always been a fan of, you know, R and B jazz and, and funk jazz and, and real jazz. But I think there has been a certain connotation with the smooth jazz uh, terminology in that whole um, radio format of um, that, you know that format I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, sure. It's called it's called smooth jazz radio. I mean, and, and 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 at one time that was huge. And let me say this: I've had I've had huge success on it. I've got one. I've got a couple of songs that are standards in that area. Quiet storm. Quiet storm as well. Thank you. Yes, quiet storms. But in truth, in truth, 
Uh, and, and that's a whole nother conversation because I know you're talking about funk and stuff and you know, um, you know what's interesting about smooth jazz. And I'll say this because this should be said, you know, it's funny. Uh, there, there were record companies out there um, at the height of that that wanted, um, it was interesting. As a black artist, you couldn't be too funky. How about that? That's what I want to say. As a black artist and doing the height of smooth jazz, when I was making my records for Shanaki, as a matter of fact, um, it was kind of like, hey, I would make half of the records for myself and half of the record was theirs. But there were some times when they couldn't figure out how to market you if you were too black. How can you be too black doing your own music? But on the other hand, and I'm not saying this is a racist statement, but I'm just showing how, how things are and how people think, is okay when a white artist can be more funky than you and nobody says anything about that. Hmm. Go figure that out. You know, we'll, we'll put that out there and, and let, and let that's somebody- That's a travesty. That's, that's one of those that's many, a, many travesty. musical travesties. Um, but, Kevin, Kevin, back at, so in the 70s though, I think it was this great era of blending all those different styles with jazz. And I don't know if that's happening as much today. Why do you think it was so much more free and open back then? Because you had to be musicians back then. In, in the days turn of time, you have technology that can help you be a musician. Back then, you had to need you needed to know how to play. You needed if you were going to play jazz or R and B, you had to play an instrument. So you had to have a certain proficiency. You couldn't just be a turntable guy. You just couldn't um, do it with samples. And that and that has this that has this cause that has this relevancy. But back then, also look, most of us came from uh, situations where we had private lessons. I had private lessons. I went to college for music. I knew music. And a lot of people out there um, and a lot of groups, a lot of artists, uh, vocalists, they knew music. So today you have less, a lesser degree of that. And so the yardstick of measurement for what's good musicianship, some of the people coming up are amazed by it that don't have that background of, of, of going to a public school where you had a band or you had orchestra or you had piano lessons. Um, so I think back then um, you were encouraged to, and you were also encouraged back then to strive for excellence. And um, I think the bar is a little different in some places now. Not to say that it's all bad and that the old stuff was good. No, there are a lot of artists out here striving for excellence. But I think live music is something that just can't be replaced and it's just going to always uh, be here and stuff.